Welcome to SBS 101 Introduction to Anthropology. We're going to explore chapter 9 of our book. In this chapter we're going to uh, talk about the most uh, ancient or archaic of uh, the versions of humans in the planet and uh, we're going to be exploring the period of time when humans branched out of other uh, types of advanced primates that were there at the time most important element to keep in mind is that uh, the homo genus actually separated because of one specific trait that was uh, prominently develop developing in this in this time which is the ability to use the brain and uh, it is shown in different tool making traditions uh, some of which we're going to be exploring uh, there are three that you should keep in mind is the older one tradition which is the oldest one the Julian tradition and then the Musterian tradition. These traditions are different because of the level of complexity of the tools that are present in, in the toolkit uh, that is usually found around or associated to uh, places and layers of um, occupation of these different iterations of the archaic homo. And then we will also talk about the closest of the uh, uh, members of this genus that are actually human, just like us, but it's a different subspecies of humans. This is the Neanderthals, who lived uh, not so long ago in terms of evolutionary time. They um, disappeared from the planet about 30,000 years ago, which is, uh, think of it, uh, just the last few fractions of a second in the um, evolutionary time span of the planet. All right, let's uh, start exploring. So what what happened is that at, at, at the very early stages we separated from the Australopithecines, which Australopithecines you may remember Lucy, the Australopithecine afarensis was the the probably the most famous of those um, uh, um, of that species uh, that we have in mind. But there were many others. So at a stage in time we roamed the planet. We the the um, hominins together with the Australopithecines, uh, so it's the early Homo and the Australopithecine Boise. Um, the first versions of the Homo genus is the, uh, what we call today is the Homo erectus and the Homo habilis. Erectus um, uh, that was in the plant about 1.9 million years ago and um, the, the the traces that we have talk about an animal who was specializing in hunting, gathering, and scavenging. Hunting large animals, gathering, which means an understanding of the vegetation and, and where to find things, and scavenging, that is um, taking advantage of other killings from other animals and, and uh, just um, literally surviving. Uh, it was a time in which uh, with just a, a few hundreds or at the best uh, thousands of, of uh, members of the species. So you can say that at this all, all throughout this time we were not just a new species but the Homo um, genus was actually a species that was at the brink of extinction. We we could have very well not have any any Homos in the planet. So um, other specimens that are important to keep in mind are the rudal fences and the, uh, certainly the Homo habilis. Um, there's uh, so for some of these species, um, it's just a few remains that actually lead uh, scientists to understand that there was a different branch present at the time. But uh, you can see that uh, many of these uh, advanced uh, primates started to develop a larger brain sa size and the uh, ability uh, it is assumed that an ability to process complicated uh, elements of their environment. Um, so um, those are the, the most important changes that are present in, in these iterations of animals. In this cranium you can see how it's, it's expanding more and more so you can go from 400 to all the way to 1400 um, uh, cubic cent centimeters in, in a brain case. Uh, all these um, images are sort of reproductions that are done using forensic techniques that will give us a sense of what the what that uh, animal would look like. You will recognize traits that are familiar with other than that seem to be yeah, uh, 
re far removed from us. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Abilis and Erectus. So Abilis uh, has been dated as far back as 1.8 million years ago by Mary Leakey and uh, she has been working in the Turkana Lake Basin which by the way if you look at what's going on today Turkana Lake it's just uh, dramatic. Uh, the lake is um, drying out and people there are really having a hard time but that's today. Back in the days uh, it wasn't a dry lake bed but it was kind of a lush forest and um, it was a very different place. Um, uh, some of these um, earlier uh, more archaic hominids have an ability to climb trees that can be um, gathered by uh, just exploring the uh, anatomy of their arms and, and limbs and their the attached muscles that should have been there. So that tells the uh, paleoanthropologists that these animals were able to still uh, feel really comfortable uh, using trees as a, as a place for habitation. The cranial capacity is going up to 600 700, 700 uh, cubic centimeters which is about half of the size of our brain and um, and then eventually it gets replaced by a new uh, subspecies of the homo genus that is the homo erectus Abilis comes from ability, it's the same word so in homo habilis you can start seeing some some of the features that uh, that are very um, permanent in humans uh, but Homo erectus the, the point is that these were the very first ones that actually roamed the planet um, bipedally for good they left the forest and they were totally adapted to life on on solid uh, ground uh, I have posted a couple of clips here for you to watch at a later time I'm not gonna play them now but it, I think it's important that you come back and take a look at the slideshow and, and see these clips that are have been selected for you um, in terms of differences between Avilis and Erectus um, again Avilis a little earlier 1.9 million years ago but Erectus was uh, it did show a greater dimorphism that is the, the male um, was much larger than the female, which means a higher level of specialization by gender. Um, the, there's a difference in terms of the context in which Erectus and Abilis are living, and um, it seems like uh, for for the environment that was um, adding pressure to the survival of Erectus, it was much more important hunting than than other aspects of making a living and that actually s selected some of the characteristics that uh, remain in, in Homo erectus definitely the um, the fact that they were uh, completely out of the forest so as you can see Erectus eventually uh, evolves a higher uh, cranial capacity and the implication is that uh, they were able to solve more problems than the, than the Homo habilis Um, one the one of the other aspects that is important besides the fact that they were great gatherers and hunters compared to other iterations of Homo was the fact that um, they were able to work in smaller groups as they as they um, inherited from Homo habilis the ability to create tools and, and shape uh, spears and, and break bones with large uh, hammers that they created uh, they were able to survive better in small groups and it is um, implied and understood that they were able to really work in small bands in a way that uh, other great uh, apes and, and, and primates were not able in the past so that's a big difference with the erectus so obviously cranial capacity is an indication of, of this complexity larger complexity in, in collective behavior uh, together with many other traces uh, here's another clip that I want you to take a look at that explains precisely how Erectus um, were able to spread and change through time. I'm not going to play now, but uh, but I, I really want you to take a look at this when you look at the slideshow. Alright. And the slideshow, f of course, is posted on iLearn this week. Let's talk a little bit about the Paleolithic 
tools of the old stone age. Uh, just so that you become familiar with the words Paleolithic, the word Paleo in uh, Greek means old and lithos or lithic is stone. Paleolithic I means just the old stone. And uh, there's actually three different uh, iterations of Paleolithic uh, tool uh, kids for different uh, members of, of uh, the Erectus and Sapiens uh, uh, species. The lower Paleolithic that belongs to the Erectus can even inherited the uh, initial development of tools that was present in Homo habilis, but the cru the tools are actually crude and and, and comparatively um, less sophisticated than the ones that you see later on in other species. But what's fascinating is that the same ability to create tools uh, it happens in Erectus in habilis and goes on to the Neanderthal and the Sapiens. So obviously there's something in common all of all these species and that's what they are considered part of the same genus and other morphological and, and uh, anatomical uh, conditions that are similar in all these species which indicate a common a common root. The Middle Paleolithic is the archaic Homo sapiens and now we're talking about different um, uh, toolkit traditions. Uh, we're going into the Trillian and then the Mustelian traditions that, as I will show you in a bit, it uh, it shows just more ability and complexity and more control. And then the Upper Paleolithic belongs to basically anatomically modern humans, MH MHS, uh, up to 15,000 years ago. Then we're going to move into different uh, traditions where metallurgy, that is the use of metals, becomes uh, the prevalent uh, characteristics, but the the era of uh, of stone, the stone age, is is the one that is portrayed here in these three moments. Uh, the uh, lithic tradition that actually supersedes the old one uh, tradition, which was the original one, is a trillion tradition. It's still the lower Paleolithic tradition, but it is associated still with Homo erectus. Uh, now you can find many other types of tools like hand axes uh, modified from core rock and then um, other more sophisticated tools um, like uh, uh, to deflesh animals and to break into bones to get the marrow and to do many other things and um, so uh, what it shows here is an increased uh, complexity in the technology I have here another clip that is quite interesting. This is uh, a paleoanthropology who has actually reconstructed the way these tools have been crafted and you will see how actually complicated it is to, to make a flake and a uh, and, uh, uh, really sharp edge for a razor uh, by using stones, which is uh, a remarkable feat and technological accomplishment by all means. So I'll let you watch that clip on your own let's keep on going about uh, some other elements about Homo erectus. As I said, what's important about Homo erectus is that it's the first one that is really roaming around the planet, just being fully bipedal and not depending on any other uh, uh, living in the forest or in the jungle. They have transitioned completely and they have they are biologically endowed for, for uh, terrestrial life in, in a bipedal mode. So there's an improvement in their tools, obviously, and then some of those biological change, changes that I just uh, um, explained show that they can actually do long distance stalking and, and, and hunting. And this is uh, something that's been documented in a very interesting way. Humans actually have an Im incredible ability for long endurance and running more than other animals. So we won't be able to run as fast as other animals, but we can l run for long distances. So a, uh, a still present uh, hunting strategy, as you can see in some groups um, of hunters in Africa, is, is just continue running till you tire your prey and eventually you, you can seize the prey. That's an amazing ability that you can be that it can be traced back all the way to Homo erectus in spite of our evolutionary path. Um, uh, of course, all of the um, elements of uh, anatomy of the erectus uh, show that uh, this lifestyle was about hunting and 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 this type of life on Earth. That's how paleontologists know what's going on with this groups based on just a, a few bones and, and uh, elements. Alright, 
let's keep going so uh, as you read the book you're gonna find uh, are you gonna see what are the fossil um, uh, evidence for their uh, presence and uh, one of the things that is interesting is that they actually spread all over the um, the old world if you like all the way to Asia and China and uh, and certainly covering part of Europe uh, the Middle East and and most of Africa so th the range was pretty wide we didn't don't know the entire populations in terms of numbers but we can we can definitely uh, ascertain that there was a, a, a long range for this uh, species as predecessor to our own species now here's here's the uh, slide that I was uh, gonna show you in terms of uh, the tool making traditions so um, this one's right here pertain to the Olduvai Gorge uh, tradition or the Oldu One tradition and you can see that it's uh, there are less strikes less lakes but it does job it has an edge and it has an area that can be used to hold it uh, whereas in in uh, later traditions you can see m that needs to be a lot of forethought in order to to actually get this specific shape and when you see the shape repeated uh, once and again and again you can see that it is a technique it's not just a, a pure a chance that it uh, happened like that and to create this really sharp edge that you can that you can see here you need to have technique that actually enables these these uh, hand axe to be what it is, a, a marvelous tool for the fleshing and coping with uh, with nature uh, as hunters for great advantage. All right. Um, morphologically, that is, in terms of the way um, uh, these um, members of the Homo um, uh, genus evolve, I think it's important that you take a look at some of the key differences like for example the school if I ask you to take a look at this and tell me what's the difference might be a little difficult at first but uh, one salient trait is how the lower section of the cranium this is a view from the back in erectus uh, it's it's wider than the one that you find for example in Neanderthal uh, which means that there's an expanded cranial capacity here and this is a species that is evolving to give um, prominence and preeminence to the ability to think and solve issues and um, in the Neanderthal it's a uh, here's a question for you to consider Neanderthal developed a cranial capacity that is higher than ours they are over 1400 uh, st um, cubic centimer centimeters uh, whereas we have uh, 13 and some uh, cubic centimeters so it's higher than ours uh, we tend to think of Neanderthal as brute like uh, animals that uh, we superseded and that uh, we uh, kind of we we gain the upper hand uh, but they have a higher cranial capacity so what do you make of that that's a, that's a question that I want to ask you and eventually we will address this question later on right uh, here's a map uh, that shows the distribution of uh, of Homo erectus that I was referring to so you can see how it goes all the way to Java and and parts of China Georgia in in the Russian ex republics uh, in Eastern Europe and then most of Africa and certainly the Middle East so the red dots indicate places where there's been um, uh, fossil evidence found and you can see how Java and all the um, Pacific Islands were connected to the continent so they were great uh, great walkers and uh, it shows it really it's a species that was present only in Africa and that eventually expanded uh, uh, all over the, uh, the old world which is amazing Right, so with this spread, you you have what it's known as uh, there's there's a theories of uh, out of Africa that is how humans uh, went from only emerging in Africa to occupying the entire planet. And uh, Homo um, erectus is the first part of the sur first wave of Homo's uh, Homo's uh, genius genus that actually left uh, left Africa. Uh, here's some of the dates for you. Uh, 
the archaic homo sapiens that is the very first iterations of our own species can they be dated back to 300,000 years ago to all the way to 28,000 before present Neanderthals on their hand go from 130,000 to 28,000 before present so they actually disappeared not long ago as I was mentioning here's the table with some of the fossil groups that you're gonna find in in your book and this is an interesting table because that, that way you can have a, an easier sense of um, not just uh, the time span but also uh, main characteristics and in, in, uh, sites where they were have been found so you see the difference between the Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans which is striking and interesting to grapple with All right. Um, uh, I want to finish this presentation just mentioning a little bit about the ice age and how that gave way to the presence of the uh, Neanderthal. The Neanderthal is uh, an the evolutionary result of uh, different iterations that go from Erectus to Antecesor, Heidelbergensis and other, and other types that can, can be related to Neanderthal but the fact and what we know for sure is that they were incredibly well adapted to the uh, age of the ice in Europe. They were bulkier than uh, modern human beings, they were thicker and they were incredibly well adapted to to live and, and withstand a really harsh uh, climate that we wouldn't be able probably to to withstand uh, happily with the tools and, and resources they did have. Uh, there's there's two uh, in Spain. There's been a great uh, deal of work done in terms of understanding our process uh, becoming human, modern humans. And there's a site of Atapuerca that I've taken students to every summer. I'm taking another group next summer, <coughs> and um, in Atapuerca they have been able to show a, a uh, continuum going from Erectus all the way to, to Neanderthal although they don't have Neanderthal specimens there but they have the, the ones that are antes, uh, that are before the, the Neanderthal which is the antecessor and then Heidelbergensis uh, some flakes which uh, speak about the, the continuation of the um, increasing uh, sophistication of the human mind until we go to the um, to our the, the modern humans that are the ones that are actually uh, adapt in a way that uh, it will eventually replace the Neanderthals at least that was the uh, common wisdom but in recent times a few years back uh, there's been some uh, a DNA evidence that we share some of the um, so some of the design of the Neanderthals uh, in a way it says that we have a Neanderthal in ourselves uh, of sorts there are, there are elements of our DNA that that can only be traced uh, to Neanderthal so it's not necessarily that we were uh, separate uh, but we we evolved together uh, it's just an interesting time uh, and understanding the relationship between the, the Neanderthals and, and us the modern humans all right I'm gonna skip some of these um, um, the slides. Uh, this is uh, where I mentioned the difference uh, between Neanderthals and modern humans to give you a couple of uh, elements about modern humans. So we're we're likely to have evolved from from earlier versions of Homo's uh, members of the Homo gen genus, and um, but certainly with an African ancestor. The, our species, the fully modern human uh, Homo sapiens, um, they came out of Africa and, and they were form, fully formed about 195,000 years ago. Um, so we're, we're a recent species by evolutionary standards, but we were able to, uh, to spread out of uh, Africa into the entire world because of those magnificent traits that uh, for survi survivability for our species where the probably the most important characteristics is uh, of humans is the flexibility we're not really good at one thing but we're good at many things and that's what makes us uh, superb so again uh, roughly 200,000 years ago so if anyone wa uh, asks you when did humans uh, uh, modern humans emerge and we're 200,000 years old so happy birthday to you all all right. Um, 
there are different theories about how we uh, evolved and one of the theories that you must keep in mind uh, as part of your understanding of this uh, complex field is the multi-regional understanding that is that uh, there were different places in the planet where humans evolved the way they are right now and mostly traced back to Homo erectus this is a uh, this is a theory that has been proposed by Wolpoff and that it's that has been opposed by many others but it's an interesting um, alternative understanding of how we evolved so as opposed to just coming all together from one place he proposes that we evolved uh, similarly in different regions of the planet it's a problematic uh, view but uh, there's some evidence that uh, needs to be uh, considered all right so um I don't want to uh, finish the presentation without talking a little bit about Homo floresiensis, which is one of the most different, uh, uh, recent discoveries of uh, the Homo genus, and uh, this is what uh, what was called and portrayed in the media as the uh, the Hobbit, and they were really short by uh, by human standards, and um, even their cranial capacity is it's uh, relatively small, but it's proportionate to their size, and it seems like they would they would give um, a credit to the Wolpoff's theory of uh, of a uh, multifocal um, uh, evolution, as they clearly evolved into a a version of human of the human kind uh, on its own in an independent place. Um, they lived uh, until recent, uh, again from ninety five thousand to thirteen thousand uh, years before the present, but they eventually disappeared. Some speculate that it was because of a volcanic eruption, but they were focalized in just one area, that is the island of Flores in Indonesia. All right, so with this, I I leave it like that. Have a nice read, and uh, see you soon.